on this episode of Edge of the Web. Featured snippets in Google, to me, was probably the best thing they ever did. Uh, because suddenly we started to see that, hey, by doing things as simple as making your content scannable, as adding bullets, as maybe organizing things in a table, Google would start to pick that up and um, reward you. Your weekly digital marketing trends with industry trend-setting guests. You're listening and watching Edge of the Web. Winners of Best Podcast from the Content Marketing Institute for 2017. Hear and see more at edgeofthewebradio.com. Now, alongside Tom Broadbeck, here's your host, Aaron Sparks. Hello, world. Hey, welcome back to Edge of the Web. Hey, we're broadcasting from Edge Media Studios, downtown Indianapolis, Indiana. Every week we bring you the latest trends in digital marketing as well as marketing influencers from around the planet. Thanks for joining us. Uh, You can check out all the show material at edgeofthewebradio.com. That's edgeofthewebradio.com. We're powered by Site Strategics, your digital marketing pioneers operating and specializing in the agile digital marketing uh, strategy and execution. So if you're interested in what that is, go check us out at sitestrategics.com. That's S-I-T-E strategics.com. And you can learn all about what we do over there from a digital marketing focus. And and it all just boils down to results, making sure that we can agilely move uh, different tactics to be able to bring a better cost per acquisition and bottom line to our clients. I'm your host, Aaron Sparks. I'm the CEO of Site Strategics as well as Edge Media Studios. And the reason why we do this show is a very sp- special reason, and it's been a la- labor of love for about six years, over six years. Right, Tom? It is. It was six years beginning of this month, actually. That's right. Yeah. And we didn't even have a birthday party. <laughs> we had an opportunity to have cake, and we didn't have it. I'm kind of disappointed <laughs> And uh, to, in the production studio is Tom Broadbeck. Uh, he's the director of digital media. How are you doing, sir? Hey guys, how are you doing? Oh, look at that! We got you. We got you I've on camera. I put myself on camera this time. So and you're and you're dressed nicely too. I did. I got my my <laughs> ears lowered yesterday. <laughs> Everything looking looking dapper, looking dapper, looking I'm dapper. Trying. Well, thank you for manning the helm there. Appreciate it. Yep. So uh, we we talk about this on a regular basis, but it, it, it's worth repeating all the time. Is the reason we do the show is certainly to bring our audience um, uh, awareness of the newest and most immediate uh, digital marketing tactics. What's trending in the space? And on top of that, giving you the ability to to separate the wheat from the chaff and and what sh- what are good tactics and what are things that you should leave alone. Uh, uh, especially in the digital marketing realm in the last 15 years, there's been a lot of things that have uh, made it to the cutting room floor of tactics that that we should not be deploying. And uh, you want to you want to do great work and great work often for your clients. But another reason and, and a bit self selfish reason of why we do the show is to make sure that we keep our powder dry, that we're continually learning in the digital marketing space. So it's been a discipline over the last six years. And we're certainly blessed to be able to have uh, the talent here in 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 uh, site strategics to be able to take what we learn here and be able to put it into action for our clients. So that's what we do and why we do uh, Edge of the Web. Uh, so I introduce you to Tom. Let's introduce you to our guest, Lauren Baker, the founder of Search Engine Journal. Sir, how are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me, Aaron and Tom. Appreciate being here. Yeah, you're more than welcome. More than welcome. And uh, I, I tell you what, it's a it's a pleasure. It's an honor to be able to to, to speak with you. We've been we've been stalkers from afar here here in Indianapolis, and uh, we've always uh, relished the content that comes out of Search Engine Journal. So I appreciate that greatly. Thank you. Well, you're more Thank than welcome. You. Well, we certainly want to uh, dive into some digital marketing news, and I almost guarantee we've got one from Search Engine Journal today. How about that? Here we go. <laughs> All right, let's get going. I was very excited to start my reportings. This week's trending topics. All right, so uh, from the state of digital, the AMP Conference uh, 2018 key announcements and highlights from Barry Adams. Uh, I, you know what, Tom? I'm going to ask you uh, to dive into this particular article. Uh, let us know what's going on here. So AMP Conf 2018 is the second annual, uh, is the second time they did this conference. Mm-hmm. Um, but they kind of highlighted some of the things you could do with AMP, some of the new uh, things. So Barry Adams had a great summary 
uh, article here of what uh, what happened at the conference. And the biggest uh, announcement that they had was the AMP for email. So AMP is no longer going to be strictly on your website. It's all going to be going into your email. And they had some cool use studies. They mm-hmm. had Doodle up there and Pinterest. I was watching um, in this article. They had the videos, uh, the presentations of it. And I'll scroll down a little bit more so mm-hmm. you can kind of see it. Um, but they had Doodle. They had Pinterest and kind of how... Um, they were able to use AMP for email uh, uh, through through their platform. Um, also, AMP Stories, which is pretty much Instagram Stories or Facebook Stories, if you, you uh, follow that. Um, that's coming to your Google search results here in the near future. Mm-hmm. Uh, pretty similar, and they kind of showed how, how to build one there. Um, WordPress and AMP had a good announcement of um, how to uh, um, <clears throat> of new updates coming to their AMP plugin. Mm-hmm. And uh, some other highlights that he um, provided here. Aleda Solis had a great uh, presentation oh, about very good. AMP and uh, SEO. I think it's a little bit further down here. So lots of lots of good stuff in this article here. So I, I thought we'd highlight it. But AMP for AMP for emails was the big thing. I'm I'm thinking they're sticking with AMP. How about you? <laughs> I don't think it's not going away. I don't though. think it's going anywhere. <clears throat> so Lauren, uh, your thoughts uh, and 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 and. and there's no right answer, right? What are your thoughts on AMP? Um, if you would ask me that a year and a half ago, yep. I'd tell you, what are we doing this for, right? But just looking at a lot of these examples that have been rolled out, it actually excites me to the fact point where AMP is no longer a Google search play. It's no longer a Google news play. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think one of the most under uh, underused components of AMP to date has been the Google Play newsstand. We've seen a lot of... Um, traffic come from that and uh the fact that now utilizing amp is a plus for email marketers it's a plus from a speed perspective phones aren't going to crash anymore while you're trying to download a uh, marketing message it's instantly integrated into the page from a tracking perspective um is a big deal and, and it takes amp from being an seo play right to an seo case into more of a case that you have that you can prove across multiple multiple channels. It's exciting because I, what I'm seeing from this is that Google is Google is giving us the ability to craft the, the content that we typically publish into multiple different forms, mm-hmm. whether it be the stories, whether it be the emails, whether it be everything else. And to me, that's exciting because it means for me from a publishing perspective and also you know when working with clients, those are forms of content that are easily created without that much more resources being dedicated to doing so once you get past that first step of getting integrated into these programs. So I find that to be exciting. Um, if I can utilize my AMP to publish, to power something like Google Stories or Facebook Stories or Instagram Stories or Snap Stories or whatever it may be, that gives me more reason to, to, to continue using AMP because I haven't not really seen uh, as much value from an SEO perspective. So it's yeah. kind of t- it's taking uh, some of the, uh, the the barriers out of play, and you have a consistent platform that you can deliver uh, from a, from a centralized location. Absolutely. Thoughts, Tom? Let me mute my mic here. Uh, the, the, <laughs> no, I mean, like I said a couple weeks ago, I've it, year, like Warren said a year and a half ago, I, 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 we hated it. Right? You right. Every website looked alike. Every web, uh, there was no call to actions you can do. Right. Every it was just picture text, and there was really no point. And there, there was no uh, ability to control conversions. Yeah. I mean, it was stripped down, right. and there were there were just there was just nothing there that we could yeah. get get yeah. our hands on. My my only thing now, it, I mean, I, I, as they're releasing more and more and more, it, it's come, becoming harder for me to hate. My my main <laughs> thing is it's the adoption rate. Right. Like we struggle. I mean, how many businesses don't even have websites? Yeah, like, and how how do how do these <clears throat> smaller businesses compete with right. with some of these big boys with with a lot of these AMP features? I mean, not necessarily the email, but the the, the stories type of thing. And and do they give t- too many points of of value or or you know merits for lack yeah. of a better I mean, it's description? Not, it's not easy to. I mean, you have to hire a developer. That's right. So I mean, it's not an Instagram story like I could just do it with my phone right now, or it, that's that's easy. Right. Um, AMP AMP stories is not an easy for a non-developer to implement. No, you're absolutely right. So, I mean, there's an adoption principle there, right, Lauren? It is, but at the same time, they're also using a tactic that 
they used when they rolled on AMP was, hey, we'll give you that carousel space sure. that your competitors who aren't implementing it won't be able to get, right? Yeah. Yep. So at the same time, is this it's a little bit of the carrot at the end of the stick sure. as well. Hey, you can do this in email. Hey, maybe your maybe your emails won't get filtered into promotion folders if they're done with that. Um, True. If you're doing this on the, on the story side, hey, where are the stories going to appear uh, in in the mobile experience? Right above knowledge graph or integrated in the knowledge graph or something along those. Like we've already seen Google right. My Business integrate video and rich media into uh, knowledge cards on the right side of the screen. So is the knowledge graph now going to show AMP oriented stories as opposed to video, which will load faster and be a uh, user experience that's much more uh, relevant to say folks in their twenties and thirties that have grown up, grown up with uh, uh, stories and things like that. So it's that play towards the, the 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 rank zero that you're talking about, and and uh, if you're playing in Google Sandbox, they're going to reward you, obviously. So um, it, it may be a tough thing to to do to adopt some of this from a small business standpoint, but uh, to get a leg up on competition, uh, you got to look at those those differentiators, and AMP certainly is one, and, all, and the Google My Business space is certainly one that's kind of unfolding like a flower right now for, for local businesses with the QA, uh, the Q&A tools and, and the like. So um, fantastic. I, I think it's it's great to be able to see it, and I was a hater. I'm sorry. I was. I just didn't, yeah. I didn't like the space that they were giving us. It really, really looked heavy-handed, but I got to agree that there's there's uh, no more there's more to it now, sure. and it's more stable as well. Yep. Do you enjoy it from a user perspective though? No. Like if you're <laughs> on your phone and you know you have a really bad connection, and you see that lightning bolt, which right. I would think more people would click on because it's the flash symbol, right? Yeah. Um, I, I know me personally, if, if I'm in an area where I don't have the best cell reception, I'll just click on AMP stories all day. Uh, you, you know, if they had a bat symbol as a flash symbol, as opposed to a flash symbol, I'm not a Marvel guy. I'm a DC guy. So maybe uh, I'm a very small minority here on I. <laughs> all right. Hey, uh, from Search Engine Journal uh, by, uh, by from uh, Joe Castro, Google Ad Grants changes what you need to know. Now, if you don't know about Google Grants, then shame on you for 501c3s uh, around, the plan around the country. Um, Google provides uh, grants uh, for for advertising with with, with their Google money, uh, and they'll actually give you up up to ten thousand dollars to start off with if you if you uh, adhere to their their, their practices and uh, uh, comply with certain certain uh, regulations. Uh, they give a, a platform for uh, any nonprofit to be able to uh, get their message out. So on December fourteenth, many Google AdWord grant advertisers actually received an email from Google Ad. Ad Grants team notifying that the $2 maximum CPC limitation has been lifted, effective immediately to those who are using maximized conversions, automated bidding. So here's the deal is that the Google Grant environment gives you uh, about $330, $330 maximum per day uh, execution, and uh, you, have a, you have had a $2 maximum CPC. Well, guess what? Now, now with automated bidding and utilizing the the, the AI tools for uh, AdWords, is it, you now have the ability to expand beyond that, be able to get higher ranks, and and subsequently get more and more traffic coming into your website. At least more potentially more qualified traffic. You're still going to be limited to uh, the the ceiling of distribution per month, which is also a bit of a challenge that uh, uh, we've always had to look at because if you have event-oriented type of marketing and you want to push more in and have a larger ceiling of uh, a larger threshold on a daily basis, you weren't able to actually execute that. But at least the, the CPC uh, ceiling has actually been lifted, which which is pretty cool. So what actually ha exactly has changed? Uh, after reading the actual program policies, you'll see there are some significant changes in some cases that could suspend a grants account altogether. So you got to pay attention to this as well, is that the policy max CPC, if you have uh, a, a, a bidding policy going on, the bids cannot actually exceed $2, and there's a ceiling there. Uh, account click-through rates, uh, there are no restrictions on performance. However, they also give you the ability to grow into a potential $40,000 grant if you have a consistent CPC uh, over 1%. Uh, what is it? Uh, what is that? Uh, 
I don't think that's the. I think it's actually. A, yeah, I think it's a CTR. If I'm not mis mistaken, um, click through quality scores have no restriction. Length of keywords no restriction. Types of keywords no restriction. But uh, the new policies have have uh, you cannot have no no overly generic keywords. Uh, you must actually be relevant to locations. Uh, you, if you want to zoom that up a little bit uh, there on the on the screen, Tom, if you can. Nope, can't do it. Uh, you must they must have relevant locations of your nonprofit listed. You must have two active site links. Uh, so previously, you didn't have to have ad, uh, site links in your ad. You do now have to have those, and you, you need at least two ad groups per campaign. Uh, so there's a number of different changes, and if you're managing any Google grants, you got to jump in there and pay attention to this article. Great summary of all the policy changes, and uh, we certainly applaud because uh, it's 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 not really a, a regularly uh, talked about uh, uh, part of the Google ecosystem, but it is valuable, especially for the for the five hundred one c threes. Yeah, I, I, how, how do you apply for it for people who aren't? There is a non Google non for Google for nonprofits. Uh, just search Google uh, nonprofits. You'll find the link, and you can actually submit right then and there. It's uh, you'll you'll have to log in with your Google account, and uh, you'll just go through the process. Very very easy. And on top of it, uh, there are a couple of requirements. You have to have been in existence as a five hundred one c three for a period of years. You just can't create a five hundred one c three and get then money, go get yeah. a grant. Right? That would be silly. Uh, <laughs> but it is a, is a worthwhile uh, campaign. In fact, we worked on one several years back. That was it was a, a very important campaign. It was a it was a, a sadly enough it was a Christian suicide hotline that we managed their their uh, campaign for, and we were able to over the course of uh, months get past a particular uh, threshold where we got we were able to get them awarded forty thousand dollars per month by by Google, and it was a very very uh, worthy cause. So anyway, I talked enough. Lauren, any thoughts about this? I know you're not in the PPC world, but yeah. uh, from a Google just from a Google perspective. And their philanthropy. What do you think? I think it's pretty interesting. This is one thing I, I really do not know that much about. But I, I have a question. So if I'm a, if I am a nonprofit that's been around, I can apply and then get 10k a month. Yep. More or less in credit. To, uh, it, it's a true grant. Yeah, uh, it, it is. It's okay. like it's, it's like Google Monopoly money, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And then, uh, <laughs> okay. So, but it sounds like there's going to be more. Let's say. Uh, expertise needed in managing the account based upon the restrictions and the ability to to possibly lose some of that budget. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, 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 says, go ahead. Oh, which says to me, I mean, it, it, if there's some agencies out there that specialize in Google grant management and or um, certifications or teachings or courses, mm -hmm. right, that you can give to someone that's maybe at a smaller nonprofit that doesn't have that marketing team to kind of train up for this, right? Because I would hate to see somebody at a small or a nonprofit that's just gone through this grant program and now has to kind of really learn PPC. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, yeah. they actually started with some very minimal re requirements. In fact, one of them was that all you had to do was t they had a minimum requirement of uh, managing the campaign once in a month. I mean, right. that's like the... <laughs> That's almost set it and forget yeah. it kind of thing, but I mean they're yeah. they're 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 moving their re requirements up, and I think I think it's good to do that because you could actually spend that money. I wouldn't say unwisely, but you're not getting the best benefits. So I really do think that these requirements are leveraging the tools and assets that are inside of AdWords. Site links are a, a, a huge CTR rate outside of the headline. In fact, you can get six seven percent click through rate on these site links. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, people are trained in very much the same way as SERPs and, and looking at uh, uh, additional uh, um, uh, uh, value that Google's presenting. So they're really kind of moving people towards, hey, make use of more tools here. Yeah, but right. you're absolutely right. You'd hate to see uh, some of the Google grant money uh, d dissipate from some of the organizations that just don't know any better. And market smart, smartly too, right? So right. it sounds like from what I was reading, you do have the ability now to maybe do some more broad-based campaigns, but those aren't necessarily going to get you the click-through rate that you're looking for. Right. You said make better use of the tools around people that may scroll past you. Yeah. Yep. But I mean, just for public awareness, I mean, there's so many clients, so many companies, even in Indianapolis, that have no idea that Google grants even exist. Yeah. And I mean, that's that's a shame right there because Google's giving away millions of dollars monthly to this program. So, kudos to Google on that one. 
Uh, another article from Search Engine Journal. Uh, we love Search Engine Journal around here. What is it? <laughs> it, it I, this happens every week, right? <laughs> Actually, it pretty much does. <laughs> it does. Yeah. Good, yeah. From Roger Monty, uh, Google's people, uh, Google's people's all, also search for feature gets a big update. So, uh, give me a lowdown on that, Tom. So this isn't exactly a new feature as it would normally appear at the end of the search results, but they've kind of changed up, Google's changed up the way or where it would um, be placed in the search results. So I'll scroll down here. So he searched for best lures for striped bass at night. And so he clicked on the first search result and then came back to the search result and they had this little pop-up um, that right below the first search result with other search terms. Mm -hmm. um, it's not tied to just the first result. It can be tied to, he showed where he clicked on like the third result and he had the same thing up here of other similar search terms. So it's no longer at the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, it might still be at the bottom. I haven't, I haven't checked to see if it's still at the bottom, but it's being, um, I don't know if you've Yeah, I'm, sorry, I'm starting stuff. to see it in a couple different places. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's kind of just a new spot. Um, we're not real sure. It could be just Google's wanting to see how we react to it. Mm -hmm. I kind of like it, so you don't have to scroll to the bottom. If if you're not happy with the first result, Google's uh, Google's goal is to be that, that have that first result be the answer you're looking for. So if that's not the result, they need to know the information why right. that whatever you searched um, in the first result didn't line up. So, You know, um, yeah, I certainly want to defer to Lauren on this, but my take on, and this has been my take on the, uh, the active uh, 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 fill inside of the search bar as well, um, it's a bit self-fulfilling, um, and a bit sometimes a little bit lazy. I think is that okay? Well, I'll just gonna go. I, I, I get it. I, I get it's very helpful. It's almost like a, gar, a guide rail of okay, this is where you're really wanting to go over here because mm -hmm. most people are actually the crowd's going over here. But there's uh, what about those unique phrases that just aren't popularized that are are useful search patterns? I, I just too much help can can be a bad thing mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes. I don't know. Maybe I'm just contentious today. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, what do you think yeah. about that? Well, I, it's kind of interesting because I've been playing around with it. And the one thing I have figured out is that based upon the result that you click on, mm -hmm. when you click back, you get different people also search for. So it's it's not the same as at the bottom. Um, they seem to be put together based upon the type of site that you visit. For example, right now I'm searching for best Indian food in Los Angeles because it's lunchtime here. And I'm getting hungry. Um, and when I click on Yelp, for example, uh, which the title is best Indian food in Los Angeles, and I click back, I'm seeing recommendations like Indian food, Sherman Oaks, Indian food, Culver City. So what Google is getting from that is they, they're thinking that, hey, maybe I did not find the specific city location or town location based upon the search. And they're trying to learn exactly what area that I'm searching for. In the back of my head, hmm. I'm taking that same, some sort of AI learning capability, right? Trying to pinpoint my location, where I like to visit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, maybe to make things better for voice search in the future. If I click on a magazine like LA Weekly or Eater.com, um, and then I click back, I'm seeing completely different uh, results about uh, different food websites, uh, Indian food websites. Um, uh, specific restaurant names that are listed in the articles in these magazines. So interesting. Or, uh, that part of to me is really interesting because it's almost like it goes back. It is very self fulfilling. Like I'd like to see the link that goes directly back to where you were and the information you're looking for, or something along those lines. Yep. But it's telling me that hey, um, you know, based upon first of all the, the type of site whether it's transactional or informational and then secondly what kind of information is, is in the landing page google is, is then serving suggestions based upon hey you click back you didn't find what you're looking for you need more help finding what your intent is right so yelp yeah my intent is probably to find a closer location in the magazine my intent might be to find a specific restaurant review um and that part of it i think is interesting from a user perspective, I don't necessarily see the benefit, nor have I really utilized it, except for like being an SEO, is thinking, "Hey, how does this work?" Mm -hmm. uh, from an SEO perspective, I'm wondering if you're already getting the traffic, you're getting the bounce back. I wonder if we're going to see less repeat visitors 
right? Because mm. if someone looking for something in the results, clicks over to the site, bounces back to the results, may click back in the future, may not. Maybe Google is realizing that, hey, they didn't like what was in the site. Not only is this going to mean different search queries in the future, but possibly different search results. So we'll see. That's, that, that's a big if right there. <laughs> Huge. Massive. It harkens, uh, it, it does harken back to, uh, and this is one of the, um, building principles of Google way back when is the Bayesian logic of of your course correction. As you right. make one particular decision, they're going to be mashing up based on predictive analysis what the next decision is, the next decision. And yeah. what you're talking about is is very well that that space is that as you bounce back, as you interact with these these handrails that they're giving you, they're going to change the, the your trajectory, your course of content, and you're giving them yeah. direct stimuli. Uh, and, and response back to their, their AI engine. So, yeah, that's that, that. The purist in me just just doesn't like all the messing going around and, uh, and, and the uh, jumbling up there. But maybe this is the 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 feedback tool that they've been t they've been wanting to to, to see experience with. I mean, it's it's, yeah. it's it's cool. It's 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 interesting seeing that type of that type of relationship that we have now with the the SERP results. But um, anyway. We'll watch that with bated breath, I think. <laughs> oh, I'd like to give a nice shout out to Roger Monty. He's been writing for us now for about three months. I've always been a big fan of Roger's. Uh, he goes by the handle Martini Buster mm -hmm. on Twitter and in Webmaster World as far back as I can remember. So it's, it's cool to see you guys uh, highlighting one of his pieces. Very cool. Very cool. Shout out to Roger. Martini Buster, there's, there's, a, there's a story there. I'm <laughs> sure there is. <laughs> Well, if you want to learn about all the stories that we talk about on uh, on the show on a regular basis, sign up for the newsletter. It's free. All you got to do is go to edgeofthewebradio.com and be able to drop there right at the footer. You can sign up free of charge. We will never use your email to torrid directions. It's going to be always bringing you nuggets of digital gold. We're going to be talking about who we interviewed on the show as well as the stories just like Rogers. And, and on top of that, bring you a couple of neat things that our VIP pay members uh, get and, and they don't see it on the show regularly. So uh, if you want to join, you can also text to the number uh, 22828, the word Edge Talk, and you can sign up right there as well. So we certainly appreciate our, our uh, uh, newsletter subscribers and give us feedback. Uh, let us know how we're doing on that space. How, how about that for a segue? Wasn't that great? Brilliant. <laughs> Sorry, the delayed, the fry in the right <laughs> button. All right. Well, follow all our featured trending topics over at edgeofthewebradio.com. So uh, let's now deep dive with this week's featured guest. Now it's time for Edge of the Web featured interview with Lauren Baker, founder of Search Engine Journal. And we got the deep voice guy for you, Lauren. Thank you. <laughs> Where'd you find him? <laughs> we have uh, we have him on contract for years out of Washington, and he he does the movie trailers, he does everything, and uh, I am perpetually tethered to uh, Paul Dixon. Great, great, <laughs> great guy, awesome. and but uh, he's he's a fantastic wit too. So, uh, to our audience that don't know Lauren, shame on you, shame. <laughs> Shame. Lauren, Lauren is the founder of Search Engine Journal, and he began his SEO career in 1999. Guess what? So did I. <laughs> A long time ago. Say, what, 14 years old oh I was. Oh, so I was Tom. What's that? Eighth grade? <laughs> Freshman? Maybe? Don't do that, man. Sorry. Just don't. Well, then he quit SEO uh, to teach English <laughs> abroad. And, and and he got he got sucked back like the Godfather. He, he got back into SEO in 2003 and launched Search Engine Journal. And we're very very happy he did. Search Engine Journal has actually become the second most read search marketing publication online and employs a team of ten or more than ten staff. And has actually launched a global conference series, SEJ Summit. So um, we'd love to hear your history in your words, Lauren. Uh, unpack it for us uh, if you could. Yeah, sure. So as you stated, I quit uh, the world of SEO back in 2001 uh, to go experience uh, some life-changing events uh, in different countries. Uh, it was in 2003 that I figured out those life-changing events didn't pay my uh, college <laughs> or other bills that I had back in the States. So 
I got back in SEO. And when I did, um, as you can, as you remember, yeah. at the time was a lot of changes happened, right? Google became a major player, went from being a beta test to a major search engine. Um, and uh, some of the old sites that I used to optimize for weren't around anymore. Uh, link building had become a, a big thing, or at least link building for ranking, right? Right. right. Link building previously for, for uh, traffic. And um, so I, I needed to learn. I needed to get back into it. And I wanted to get back into it. I had enough time off. And uh, so I started uh, reading all these different forums, uh, site point forums, uh, create a site forums, and even a little bit of digital point. And what I noticed was I was staying up late answering questions. Like after I'd kind of gotten caught up, I got into the whole you know, Q&A thing, trying to help people out, this and that. And I realized, hey, I'm contributing a lot of content right now to other people's sites. Mm. Why don't I do something on my own? Uh, so around that time, Google bought Blogger. I went to some domain registrar and I typed in search engine blog and um, that was taken. So I'm like, hey, uh, why don't I try search engine journal? Because at the time, there was an argument whether they were going to be called blogs, uh, web, which is uh, for web, web blogs, blog, right? Right. right. Or web journals, right? Like live journal. So search engine journal was available. Instant credibility, right? Wall Street Journal, College Journal. So I, I gobbled it up, launched it on Blogspot, um, and started writing. And about three months later, someone emailed me saying that they would buy an ad on the sidebar for $35. And I took it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's all she wrote. Um, after a couple of years, uh, it was my full-time job. And uh, then about four or five years later, I ended up launching my first agency slash consultancy off of SEJ. And uh, now um, SEJ is, is owned by um, a company called Alpha Brand Media, which I have some partners uh, at, Jenny's Henriksen, uh, Brent Satoris, and, and Kevin Henriksen. And then my agency stuff is uh, separate from that. Uh, what's great about it, though, is that even though I'm not writing as much as I used to, I used to get up at five o'clock in the morning and try to write as many blog posts as I could before anyone else did. Um, <laughs> it still keeps me accountable, kind of like you guys with the show and everything else, right? Yep. Like one of the first questions I get on the agency side from the lead is like, you know, hey, uh, what resources do you read to keep on top of SEO news and trends? And I just let them know that I read my own. <laughs> and um, I'm still very involved from a management perspective. Uh, monetization perspective and a partnership building perspective at SEJ. It's always been a lot of fun and it's it's great to work on something that's gone beyond what you originally intended. Mm -hmm. Because for me, this was a personal endeavor, right? This is a personal blog. I never expected it to take off like it did. And then once it did, I was full of joy, but then I realized I needed more help as well to keep up with the others out there in the market. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it certainly has, uh, has been allotted and, and um, it's, it's great content. And um, one of the key things, especially in this, in this uh, age of gluts of content out there is that you can always get the straight scoop from Search Engine Journal. And, and, and it's above grade when it comes down to, to uh, content and insight. And I'm not saying this because you're on the show. Literally, you can go back through our shows for the last six years, and we've almost always had a Search Engine Journal article thematically based on what we're talking about, and it, and it was straight on point. So, I mean, kudos to that, and kudos to, to raising the bar for contributors. But you've, com you've created a community uh, of of contributors out there uh, uh, that, that that have really blossomed so many different careers in digital marketing over the years, right? Yeah, it's been pretty neat um, to see that. Uh, you know, the first couple of contributors that we had on the blog were, I, I believe, Rhea Drysdale, uh, now with Outspoken Media, mm -hmm. and uh, Bill Slosky was one of the first contributors. Oh wow! Uh, we used to work together uh, back in the day. Um, and then if you go over the list of folks that have uh, contributed or participated over time, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing to see. It's always a real joy. Like I was talking about Roger, it's a real joy to see people um, involved, wanting to contribute, being that part of their ongoing marketing and information spreading routine mm -hmm. and uh, you know, getting to know these folks a lot better. 
Uh, luckily, we have a great editor on board now, Danny Goodwin, um, who comes from more of a press and editorial background. And he also gets SEO, which is very rare to find. Um, so that that's that's really cool. It's been it's been it's been great to see that grow. And I, I appreciate what you said earlier about um, you know uh, uh, our content being up to date and being useful. Mm-hmm. I think one thing that really set uh, us apart uh, in the early days was I was writing from a marketer's perspective. Uh, so, you know, what I would try to do, even when I covered any news story was report on the news story. And then at the end, have some tactics and takeaways you could implement to your current campaign. And we've really tried to keep that going. Um, so it's great to hear. Thanks no, a lot. Absolutely. And it, it certainly crossed over to our own clients, uh, in certain regards, but, um, it, it, it was always practical, uh, work and, and practical content. Uh, and it also didn't have, it does not have. I, I, I guess these are policies of, of, of like style guide that you that you yeah. have everyone adhere to because it's also not so cerebral that we can't. I mean, we love to geek out. Don't get us wrong, yeah. but at the same yeah. time, got to pull yeah. it back and and make sure that that we can onboard uh, a, a, a number of people that maybe don't have the anal- analytical side uh, of their of their marketing. Um, dialed in and you can give that you can give them a on-ramp to to learn uh, from some of these articles so that is also part of the publishing guide of uh, a search engine journal well we wanted wanted to spend some time talking about with you the kind of the state of publishing um right. as you as you've been in this space uh, for 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 uh, a good long time what trends are you actually seeing and where do you think online publishing is going uh in the content world yeah it's an interesting question so um you know, over the years, I've made a lot of friends and colleagues in the world of publishing. Uh, some of my strong, one of my strongest colleagues that I love talking to and bouncing ideas off of is Brian Clark over at Copybook. And it's always really nice to see um, what different publishers are doing from a monetization perspective. So on their side, they they preach not advertising, right? Um, selling your product, selling a service, uh, informational marketing, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the publishers that I know um, uh, are pub- a company like Moz, for example. Right. right. Yep. So Moz's content, it's incredibly informative. It's incredibly educational. It's always has been. It's their community is what's probably set them aside. It's been their lifeline. Um, but at the end of the day, hmm. that content is utilized to market a, a tool set um, and a brand. And on our side, <clears throat> if you look at, those two examples are very different from SEJ. At Search Engine Journal, um, we've always been advertising based ever since I sold that first $35 ad. And sometimes that's been great, right? When AdSense launched and things like that. And uh, then sometimes it's been a little bit tough um, when you're trying to sell on CPM. So a couple of years ago, uh, I put together a plan to migrate off of CPM based ads, right? AdSense and everything else and go from um, 20% of direct revenue to 80% of direct revenue, 80% direct revenue from lead gen oriented initiatives. And then 20% from those advertising spots that had been our bread and butter. Oh wow! And it's been a really interesting transition because I think now uh, we can confidently say that we're a lead generation platform that utilizes content to attract and build and market to those leads and pre-qualify those leads. And what we've done is we've partnered up with a lot of the tool companies that have worked with us previously from an ad perspective. Mm-hmm. And we've gone, like I said, majority 80% uh, lead gen uh, performance-based uh, deals. So it's been, it's been a cool transition. And I think it's been something that in retrospect, right, <clears throat> when we made this decision, it was before companies and publications like Mashable saw a huge devaluation, right? Maybe Mashable got sold for pennies on the dollar, mm-hmm. basically because they had lost their, their way and um, they're entirely advertiser-based. And what we're seeing now is that advertisers, companies that used to advertise product-oriented, whether it's in the SEO world or whether it's in like companies like Gillette, they have the ability now to go direct to, through, to consumer, right. right? Through social media, through their own initiatives, when they acquired Dollar Shave Club, huge list, huge content publication engine there. Absolutely. Right? Yep. So the one trend I see, and one 
prediction I've, I've had for a while and continuing to see is that a lot of brands are, are pu- gobbling up publications hmm. because you can start your content marketing or you can go and grab something that you used to advertise on and then market that way. So oh. that's right. A lot of digital publication going. Well, and, and on top of that, the, the entire, uh, uh, tribe concept uh, and, and building uh, uh, building unique tribes for these brands. You're absolutely right. They're they're crossing over those lines where the traditional or you know, conventional ad space in publications are just are just being stepped around. Um, and these online publications, I mean, yeah, if, if you're if you're looking at you know, a six fix a six figure buyout, right, um, and, and and then some, then you have to. You have to really uh, do some introspection of whether or not you want to keep that that content and engine going, or you you allowed to get bought out. Um, that's that's the game that's being played right now. The lead gen space that you moved into, we're seeing that in a couple of different spaces in di- in different um, in different manners. Uh, that was a big risk for you, was it not? Uh, to a degree, it was, but um, at the same time, you know, we, when you're able to have that i mean from let's talk monetization when you're able to have that direct payment come in at specific terms that you define as opposed to a net 60 yep. through adsense where you're getting x question mark percentage of the spend based upon different trends in the google <laughs> algorithm right? it's a little bit more predictable yeah there you go and, and i kind of see where we've gone as being more of <clears throat> i don't want to say agency but a, just more of a solution like we, we have when we're talking to one of our partners or sponsors, we'll have a lot of our team on the call to pitch ideas, put together ideas. And it kind of reminds me of how things work on the agency side, except for it's almost like an internal agency within SEJ, just like Time would have their internal agencies or New York Times would have theirs and companies like that. So um, from a risk factor, not really, because we knew we could always flip the switch back to I got point. advertising. And, um, you know, being able to do this has let us bring in more staff members and direct writers. And we really love our community, <clears throat> but it's, it's nice to also be able to have the Roger Montes uh, and Matt Southerns of the world um, with us to be able to cover this hmm. news when it happens. And we all know there's no shortage of Google related news. No, no. Uh, <laughs> it's coming up. You know, it's an unending so, fount. Yeah, you're right. absolutely right. Yeah. Um, well, I. Uh, 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 getting into content publishing a little bit deeper, are you seeing too much written content being published? I mean, I was referencing this this glut concept. I mean, you know, there are there are discussions about content shock in the system. Are, are publishers looking for maybe different mediums to move their content? What, what are your thoughts about that? Um, I've I've always felt that from a content publishing and content marketing perspective, um, you should really try to put the best content out there within your topic matter uh if we're talking about seo right it's always been hey look at the top 10 look at the top 20 um content or transactional posts that are or pages that are ranking and if you can put together content better than anyone else has on those pages and then market that Mm. then market your brand as a whole you're going to after time get a competitive advantage and attract more links and attract more shares and traffic and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I do feel that for a while um, there was a big push on publishing as much content yeah. about words and topics as possible. So a lot of the projects that I've been working on for the past year has really been looking at all of that content that people have spent resources on and ways to merge them into epic posts or epic pieces or whatever you want to call it. Huh. So instead of having 10 pieces of content about a subject matter, say cell phone covers, whatever. Uh, And one of those pieces getting Google traffic from SEO, let's turn those all into one, right? Then all of a sudden you have a much larger, much more in-depth piece of content. You've put together the research possibly, so you have all that together. Plus, you're continuously, you don't have to market 10 pieces anymore, right? Hallelujah. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) You just market the one really good piece. And you continuously market that in email. You continuously market it in social. You continuously attract links to it. When it's time to do so, when there's something that's changed in your topic field, that's changed in your area, 
you update that on the blog post. And you know what? You have your little snippet in there that's been updated. You send that out. You alert everyone that's been updated again. You you contact some of the people that you had contacted previously for links. You know, whatever it is. But um, I, I really think that content, there's a lot of noise out there. But at the same time, most of that noise is just white noise. It's yeah. not picked up. Right. Yep. So if you can, if you can take everything that that's been invested into um, over the past couple of years and turn that into something that's really special, and then what do we have the ability to do now? We can host a podcast on it. We can host a, right. a video, uh, Facebook Live on it. Download a Facebook Live video and and put that on YouTube and embed that in a piece of content. Mm-hmm. Together, graphs, charts. I think that's one thing that you know. <clears throat> I don't want to keep on rambling, but. No, uh, featured snippets in Google, to me, was probably the best thing they ever did uh, because suddenly we started to see that, hey, by doing things as simple as making your content scannable, as adding bullets, as maybe organizing things in a table, Google would start to pick that up and um, reward you. So, of course, most content marketers that have SEO in mind and most SEOs immediately started rewriting their content like that. And at the end of the day, I think it, it's one, it's better content. Mm-hmm. And then two, um, it, it took the emphasis away from trying to uh, rank everything everywhere and trying to put together one better piece. Then three, I think Google's learning, speaking about AI and learning, I think you know Google's reading, they like to read bullets and lists and everything else. It helps, it helps them understand things. So even if we're not in the feature snippet, mm. Google still understands the content that you're putting together uh, just by the way you've organized your page. And 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 they is they basically been forced to make more utility of their of their content, right? Because uh, it, it's it's more useful uh, by and large for Google consumers. So that was a smart play. You're absolutely right. And and you're hoping that more small and medium sized businesses can jump into that. And then this is what we referenced in the in the news section. But there's there's a heck of a lot of of attraction to those those executions for marketers because they yeah. know what the hell's going on. But whenever it comes yeah. comes down to small medium sized businesses, especially with with the move towards Omnichannel media, right? The different types yeah. of media format. Um, and the brands are moving in there and, and you know, they're creating different types of content, not only just the con- contextual, but they're inside video, they're inside audio, they're, they're curating their content in a lot and multi, you know, utilizing for multiple purposes. How can small and medium sized businesses uh, compete with the big budgets of some of these brands and what they're doing in all these different spaces? Well, I think one thing that small and medium-sized businesses will always have the advantage of is technical SEO. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it seems like the some of the larger businesses I've worked with in the past, um, it just it takes forever to get something done. And um, a smaller business that that has uh, someone that knows their WordPress that can work with an agency that can actually either instantly implement what the agency tells them to do, mm-hmm. or hand over the keys to let the agency do so has that advantage point where, Hey, we can go and put together a clean site, right? A site where you might not even need AMP because it's just so clean and it's so fast, put together great content, um, interview people, uh, put together great original photos, put together great original videos. I mean, we've done this from an agency perspective. We've done this with a small chain of beauty schools where we've been able to set up and and, uh, beauty and hair, as you can see, (laughs) Hey, but we've been able to, t- to give them the competitive advantage because they're moving so much faster than their competition is because their mm-hmm. competition are, are larger chains. So set up videos, bring in local bloggers, uh, ha- have people uh, contribute to their site, have students contribute, do testimonials. All of that content is at, is at your disposal. It's just a question of taking the time to put together that plan. Yep. On how to use that, how to utilize that. So you're 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 talking about the more nimble uh, a business yeah. is, the uh, exactly. they're going to have that con- that continual advantage as opposed to trying to steer in a barge. Exactly, and I think one great example one great example of the I guess the hybrid of that mm-hmm. is looking what has happened with about.com and that being split up and then redirected into dot dash sites. Mm-hmm. So sites like. Uh, the balance. Um, uh, there's a number of, of different 
sites out there that suddenly uh, people are starting to see appear in the search results. Mm -hmm. uh, the manual is another one. A lot of them start with a, the, the spruce. Uh, so what's happened is about someone at about.com, which was one of the first major sites to go on WordPress, but then after a while it was kind of this big juggernaut of a forgotten series of guides. Right. Uh, put together the major plan and split it up, redirect everything to fast sites, the sites that, that have uh, great images to, to um, consolidate a lot of this repetitive content. And all of a sudden you start seeing them popping up in the results almost overnight. And I was even at a conference two months ago and someone asked, um, hey, how did, you know, how did the balance uh, start ranking immediately this brand new site? And I had to explain to them that it used to be about.com, uh, but it used to be the money section, the personal finance section, and all of that, which were on subdomains and then transferred over. So you know, I think when you have, you see this as CBS uh, Interactive, uh, mm -hmm. they have a great internal SEO team. Um, you know, Disney uh, and ABC, they have a great internal SEO team. So when the, uh, the larger companies start to really understand and, and, and give the green light to the folks that want to get the job done, they can zoom up. But until then, you do have the competitive advantage of smaller, medium-sized business, especially on the local side. Absolutely. To be able to optimize, make the most out of Google My Business, shoot those videos, um, put together local posts, get local influencers, get local links. It's, it's, all, it's all intertwined. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, shifting, shifting a little, little bit of the conversation here about um, maybe an individual who, or a business that wants to maybe become the next search engine journal, right? Uh, maybe yeah. maybe a different name, but uh, uh, should they have a blog or should they start a podcast or video series instead? What what I mean, if you were to start it now as opposed to back in in in, in two thousand three, right? Now that you, now you have a whole different set of mediums out here. What would your suggestion be uh, to to get started? Someone just asked me this uh, the other week as well. Oh, cool. Uh, could I do it all over again um, with? Uh, with family and, and kids, and, <laughs> uh, little league and everything else, I'm not necessarily sure. But if I were to do it again, I, I would launch the property off of a um, off of a media platform. So, for example, a lot of the Facebook lives that I do, um, like you're doing right now, mm -hmm. we end up putting on YouTube. We end up utilizing the video on the site. We end up using the audio for uh, audio podcasts. And then uh, using services like Rev.com and some others out there to transcribe the post, which we then edit and then publish on the publish on the blog as a blog post. What I've noticed is that when I, if I do a thirty minute podcast, or in this case an hour podcast, it's going to give me five six pages of blog stuff to put out there. So I really like the ability to speak about what I'm doing and ideas and interview other people mm -hmm. and put that together in a post format. Now, 15 years ago, you couldn't do that, right? You had to have a studio even bigger than yours and <laughs> not even you have uh, to be able to do so. But I think with the way that people uh, basically digest information right now, like I was kidding with you earlier on the Alex Jones thing, but you know, how many of those videos do you see going across? Oh, they're Facebook? everywhere. All day, right? And they all send people back to the site. And I'm sure if we looked around right now, we would find examples mm -hmm. of publishers out there that have started in video, especially if you have a little bit of budget or revenue behind you, because then you can utilize Facebook uh, to turn what would normally be 100, 500 organic views into tens of thousands of organic views for not that much, not that much of an ad spend, right? No. Really going to propel. Uh, it's going to propel your brand. It's going to propel you from a personal perspective. Uh, if you have something really special to say, people are going to click over to your site to read more, and that's just going to happen. And we didn't, we didn't even have social media, uh, you know, back in the day. We had uh, Usenet groups and email lists, chat and, channels. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and I would say, if you're starting right now, to make sure that you uh, start uh, planning your email list from scratch. Um, one thing that if I could go back in time at SEJ, I would have started with a, a highly managed email list from day one. Hmm. Um, we, we got really serious about that about six years ago and it's been great ever since. But if I would, 
had built that list, leveraged that list. You can use things like, you know, put that in your Facebook advertising to create lookalike audiences, target to, you know, just your newsletter fans, et cetera, et cetera. That list is something that you own and it's something that's going to become more and more and more mm-hmm. important moving forward. Absolutely. That's the, 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 inner, the inner circle of brand loyalists that uh, yeah. are going to be able to champion and share uh, in, in so so much more velocity than any other of the, the outlying factors. Um, I wanted to unpack quickly uh, your thoughts about the new search in uh, Google Search Console. Got a, got a couple minutes to, to dive into that real quick? Sure. Excellent. Yeah. So Google launched uh, out their new Google Search Console. So what are your thoughts about the new reports and the features that they've got out there? I love the new reporting. Uh, it took me a while to get used to it yeah. because of the UX being different. But the fact that I can go back not only a year, but 16 months and see. Yeah. Like that, that extra quarter of information is so valuable, right? Uh, especially from trying to match up, you know, the growth of specific terms that are being targeted, you know, everything else. So, of course, I love that. I think the biggest question moving forward is what is Search Console going to become? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I know at, uh, at PubCon Austin, Gary Yesh said that not all, I think it was Gary that said not all features are going to be ported into the new Search Console. Um, not all existing features. And then, you know, with the, the current uh, Chrome advertising score that sites will get, mm-hmm. uh, they may have their ads blocked by Chrome or not. That's part of Search Console as well. Right. It's attached to it, but it's not directly integrated into the whole experience. So is Search Console going to become more than just search, right? Because now we're talking about the way that the browser interacts with the site and the way that, you know, I would personally like to see some integration between Search Console and Google My Business, for example. So I don't have to pull the chat data and the um, phone call data and right. the direction data from a different source. The ability to integrate that all in and export that accordingly mm-hmm. would be amazing. Um, same with feature snippet data, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm excited to see what happens. I like what I've seen thus far. I'm a little bit anxious in terms of what may be lost with that transition. Um, hopefully it's not the fetch and render data. I, I see that as being a core component. I yeah. see that the read site maps as being a core component. You know, I've noticed that I got a, I got a message the other day on one of the accounts that I manage that, um, the job schema or job markup wasn't complete for their career section. Huh. And I think that was the first time that I've gotten a, a, a message. I don't want to call it a warning, but a message that, hey, your schema is not set up like we'd like you to do, right? Schema's all, always been kind of that voluntary how to get an extra step. So now Google's pushing that out. Hey, update your schema. Hey, uh, update you know what's indexable, et cetera, et cetera. So, but that's a beautiful thing, and for all the S- all the SEOs in the in the in on the in the audience, I mean, what amazing thing just to be able to be alerted by Google that they're wanting to see a little bit more from you. I mean, yeah. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Now keep on going. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no. I mean, that's that's the biggest thing. So are we going to start to see markup testing as part of Search Console? Are we going to see markup reporting? I mean, we see it to a degree now, mm-hmm. right? But what you lack, what you need, uh, what you need to compete, I think we're going to go in that direction. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing. You've been around long enough, Aaron, to yep. remember what it was like before those webmaster tools. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> And I also I also remember how how right. literally how long we had to wait just to see what we pushed out there even take hold. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So now it's I mean, I'll make an update on the site side, and it may take Google normally two, three, four days to update that uh, without using Search Console. Mm-hmm. But if I go in and fetch and then request index reindex of that page, it changes in seconds. Yep. And that just blows me away yeah. uh, from an SEO perspective. <laughs> you, can, you can test so much, um, <clears throat> but I'll see a title change or description change or whatever go immediately. Um, what I my prediction, if they do take away anything, it may be on the raw data and API side um, or ability to sync up as a partner. You're mm. seeing more tools that are pulling in that information, mm-hmm. doing things like click through rate optimization and stuff like that. I don't think Google wants us to go in that direction, so they may kind of 
lay off on the ability to access that data in external formats. That'd be tough because uh, there's a lot of reporting tools, really good reporting tools out yes. there that make use of uh, the, the, the console's data. Um, that uh, that it would be a shame because uh, they, they've done, they built, but unfortunately, you can't build a cobble company around interpreting right. that uh, because Google will move wherever they want to move. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, now we're, we're, we're excited about the new console, uh, and, and we certainly don't would, would hate to see any of the reporting. Do you see more convergence, like you're talking about, with Google My Business? Do you see it converging into analytics? I, I kind of feel like they're going to keep analytics separate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I see analytics as almost being uh, the third-party capability to track info, and then search consoles being what's under the hood, right? So... Analytics is what shows up on the radar gun, but when you flip open up the hood, that's where you have all your search console stuff. So all of the stuff, like I said, the my business, yeah. the, the I guess Chrome friendliness, um, search console information, all under there. It's like it gives us the ability to go behind the curtain at Google, tweak, see how they're uh, how they're reading things, and then analytics. I kind of see as being. I still think it's kind of silly that you have the keywords in one and then not in the other. Yeah, 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 but, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. What the hell is that anyway? Yeah. It's almost like they're thumbing their nose at us, you know? Do you think we're ever going to get the keywords back? <laughs> Why do you keep no. bringing that up? <laughs> because no. I want them back, man. <laughs> but don't take away what we have, please, Google. If you turn that into topics or something like that, oh, it's going to be terrible. <laughs> so how long do you think uh, it's going to take uh, for them to take down the old version of Search Console? Hopefully, no time soon because I'm finding myself flipping back and forth a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I don't know what the timeline is going to look like. I think they're, I think I, I kind of feel like they're doing it slowly, getting their feedback. Uh, it's, it's it's more important to businesses now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, I'd give them six months, eight to nine months. <laughs> oh man, get your data. Get your data while it's still there. Yeah. Uh, well, um, Lauren, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. I really uh, uh, thank you for joining us today and, and uh, sharing some of your wisdom um, and just the in, in insight into building a, uh, a, 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 a bastion of uh, knowledge around the search engine optimization world, let alone this digital marketing. Um, that said, uh, you're still going to be participant of uh, Search Engine Journal for the years to come, right? Oh, Absolutely. I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, I kind of so, kind of figured that, but I uh, want to make sure that we got you on enough. tape. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, go ahead. Oh no! Anyway, it's, it's been a real treat. Thanks a lot for You're having me. You're more than welcome. I, I got I got I got one question for you. Actually, I got two two questions left. You can hang on here. Oh, okay. Sorry, I, it, it did sound like I was cl closing down the interview, but I got two <laughs> things I want to ask you. Well, one, what bugs you about your industry right now? Oh man, um, what bugs me? You know, I think it is uh, a lack of patience sometimes and the ability for people to instantly jump to conclusions based upon a blog post they've seen or a study or uh, something like that. I mean, typically what happens if I am working with a new client or a new group um, of, I don't want to say young SEOs, but just people that are, are kind of new to the industry, I will see a tendency for those folks sometimes to jump right on something because they've, they've They've watched a video or they took a, um, a certification course and be like, absolutely, this is what happened. And then I'll have to say, look, just slow down. Take the time to learn the historical context of, of everything that's happened to this website previously. Take the time to look at things like migrations that have happened in the mm -hmm. past. Um, uh, through, why do you have these you know, three or one loops and these hops happening? Try, try to figure out and really... Um, diagnose everything across the board before jumping to this conclusion that, oh, because of someone said this, this is what happened to us. It's typically not the case. And I, I've seen that happen like when I uh, Google came out and said that HTTPS is going to get higher rankings. Sometimes I, I saw some sites flip over immediately and then end up being full of errors and not having, not having direct links back to your HTTPS and not having this happen. So Take the time to do it correctly hmm. and take the time to really build the case and figure out if this has to be done or not right now and what the priority is because uh, there are a lot of other priorities out there. And one tip I always have for SEOs is to be, um, uh, to be the historian 
on the site and to pass that down to the next person if they're leaving because it's incredibly important. And a lot of time, um, that's not always done on a development standpoint. And that's not always done on the SEO standpoint. So if I, if I, if I start a new project and I look into a five-year-old analytics account and I see zero citations and I have no historical uh, analysis whatsoever of what's been done, I, I really have to go back and try to figure that out, go through archive, Dot org, go through mm-hmm. <clears throat> really everything to find out those why those dips and valleys happened over time, why there was increase over time, why there was decrease. Uh, because sometimes it's really easy for someone to just say, oh, we had to disavow the links. Oh, we bought some bad links. We did this. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's the one thing that kind of gets me. Measure twice, cut once, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, conversely, what excites you about your industry right now? Oh man, you know, <clears throat> it's always changing. And before I was an, I, I, I don't know if, if I'm an, I do a lot of SEO. I do a lot of content marketing. I do a lot of publishing, right? So one thing I've noticed about SEO in general is it's just become such an important component of everything across the board. Um, you know, us SEOs, we were preaching things like load time and site speed two years ago, right? Um, now it's become incredibly more important from a, from a paid perspective, right? So Hmm. everything else. So, um, the thing that excites me the most, not only all the changes that we see happening on a day-to-day basis is the ability for what we do in the SEO industry to be becoming much more important across the board in the digital marketing spectrum. So it's the old, it's not no longer the, the, the mystery cubicle on (laughs) the floor, of some person doing this SEO magic on the site. <laughs> now it's an integrated component into everything across the board. And what we're doing and, and the KPI measurement and um, just the ROI is, is much more trackable than it's ever been. Um, the ability to have that traffic with, which comes over from, it might come over from SEO first, it might come over from social first, it might come over from paid, and it might convert somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Now we have that across the board, we have that cross device. So it's it's pretty amazing to see this mystery science of SEO <laughs> being integrated into into everything. And I think given what we've talked about Search Console, we just have much more proof and data at our hands than we've ever had previously. Hmm. That- Very good. Well, I, I, that's 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 a fantastic testament. I mean, SEOs around the world, we're ha- finally having our day, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, yeah. I, it's been it's been great to be able to see that appreciation. On top of that, marketers really embrace SEO uh, as opposed to just re- remanding it to a, 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 a analytical corner of the room. It is imperative that uh, yeah. uh, it, it works in the bloodstream of all digital marketing. Well, uh, I got to ask before we go, you went abroad to teach English. Where did you go? What cultures did you experience uh, whenever you took a break from SEO? Yeah, first I lived in a small fishing. <laughs> I lived in a small fishing town in Japan uh, for two years uh, teaching English, and that's most of the time I was I was offline. Uh, great experience. Um, oh. It was probably in the town of one hundred thousand people, maybe uh, uh, ten. Uh, foreigners or non-Japanese. We were all English teachers. So um, very different experience than say living in a city like Tokyo or whatever. Um, and then after that, Brazil. And that was when I moved to Brazil, I realized that I could not make enough teaching English to pay for my loans. So that's when I started doing S- uh, SEO again. <laughs> Good for you. I mean, you got yourself out of the space uh, that we're all kind of culturally bound in and you experienced another area. Would you recommend that to people by and large? I would recommend anyone in their twenties to take a year off and go see the world yeah. and go learn things. And then if, 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 if you feel like you've done enough, go back to where you were previously. You always have that at your disposal or even now you have digital nomads, right? So I, know. Back then, I used to have to go to an internet cafe. Uh, now I could probably do everything that I do um, uh, from anywhere. Almost anywhere, and you see that a lot in our industry as well. So um, I think we were talking about Ayeda uh, Solis earlier, yep. and her contribution to the AMP conference. She's a great example of that. Um, every time I see her update on Facebook, she's either in an airport lounge or in a plane, and she's running a business while doing so. And it's just really cool to yeah, see. It's amazing, and yeah, she she was a great interview as well. Um, and and and, and just the the new the new. 
uh, digital nomad concept. I mean, it's fantastic. We were we were plugged, we were tethered for the longest time, and now <laughs> all this and everything's cloud based. It's just beautiful to be able to see. But you got to make sure you still socialize because you don't want to have. <laughs> Yeah, have uh, have uh, people just uh, out in the woodwork and uh, never wanting to not, never wanting to return. Anyway, is there anything that we could promote for you on the show before we sign off here? Um, yeah, I mean, take take the time to go to search engine journal uh, dot com. Uh, we have upcoming series of webinars um, and ebooks. Mm -hmm. So well, one thing that we've done again on the content side is we've been publishing a lot of different ebooks. Uh, a lot of them we have partners with some of our sponsors. And we've put together an ebook library. I see that you have the link up there right yep. now. So take the time to check out our ebook library. There's a lot of information. We update our guides on an annual basis. So if you're reading our uh, beginner to SEO guide or a linking guide or something like that, you're not reading old content, right? So uh, take the time to check that out. And while you're on the site, um, sign up for one of our next webinars. We have a series called the Boss Series, the best of SEJ Summit. Okay. And a lot of our uh, speakers are doing special uh, free webinars for everyone. So check that out as well. Oh, absolutely. Fantastic. All right. Well, we certainly appreciate the time spent today. And uh, for all of our listeners, go check out Lauren uh, on Twitter, Lauren Baker, uh, on Facebook, Lauren Baker, LinkedIn, Lauren Baker, and Instagram, <laughs> Lauren M. Baker. You got all the socials out there. And from a, from a, from a, 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 a colleague uh, out here in, in the middle of uh, middle of the country, hey, I really appreciate uh, the, the, the reference to Boy Named Sue before we got on board. You and I <laughs> Share something right there. We've been scrappy in our youth, just trying to defend uh, <laughs> defend our names out there. Kudos to it's you, man. Likewise, likewise. Thanks for the good work. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, and thank you for listening to Edge of the Web Radio. A special thank you to our colleagues at Site Strategics, as well as our guest Lauren Baker. Uh, be sure to check out all the must-see videos and much more of the insider information over at Edge of the Web Radio .com. That's Edge of the Web Edge of the Web Radio .com. We will talk to you next week and do not be a piece of cyber driftwood. Take care.